Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, broadcast on Thursday the 7th of March. I'm James Seal, The Spectator's political correspondent and your host for this week's episode. Coming up on the show. What will Donald Trump do with a second term in office? Freddie Gray gives us an idea in this week's cover piece, Revenge. He'll be speaking to the journalist and author, Michael Wolfe. Jeremy Hunt delivered his second budget yesterday. Kate Andrews, Katie Balls and the OBR's David Miles will explain what happened. Douglas Murray writes his column this week about the prospect of a wider conflict in the Middle East and the plight of Israelis living near Lebanon. I'll be speaking to him. Vladimir Putin is seeking a fifth term in office as Russian president next week. I wonder if he'll get it. Owen Matthews will join me. He says Putin has ruined Russia's future prospects. And finally, it's been a big week of royal news. The Princess of Wales' uncle has entered the celebrity Big Brother house, while Kate herself has been seen for the first time in months, and Prince Harry's underpants have sold at a Vegas auction for around £200,000. I'll be speaking to royal author Angela Levin. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of the video and tap the bell icon so you never miss another episode. And thank you to our sponsors, Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management. Can Accord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during challenging times. To find out more, visit CanDoWealth.com for more information. First up, Freddie Gray writes this week's cover piece on what we can expect from a second Trump term. A constant theme in Donald Trump's life has been revenge, Freddie writes. Will he look to punish his opponents from the Oval Office? Freddie joins me now alongside the journalist and author Michael Wolfe. Now, Freddie, you write this week's cover piece for The Spectator magazine on uh, what a Trump Mark II would look like. You write in your piece that revenge has always been a great theme of Donald Trump's life. Tell us more. Uh, well, it's something he's talked about a lot. Uh, he has a book, uh, an under-recognised or underappreciated book uh, called Think Big and Kick Ass in Business and Life. Uh, and in that book, there's a whole chapter on revenge, uh, which is all... Of... Let me, if I can just interject here, however, yeah. just to point out, because I think it's always very important to keep in mind that Donald Trump didn't write the books no. that he's accredited to writing. And there's always some question if he's even read them. Just just to make that foot as a footnote. There's, that's a perfectly good point and always worth making uh, when you're talking about Donald Trump's books. But, uh, I mean, he certainly he read the forward uh, for, uh, for the audio edition, and he does seem to have been involved. It was with a, uh, another businessman who he had some curious involve, involvement with. But anyway, the point is, revenge is something that he prides himself on. He talks about it quite a lot. It taps into his mindset about, um, you know, retribution has become this sort of theme word of his campaign. Uh, he talks about it a lot. Uh, and he talks about sort of taking avenge, revenge on the deep state. And this is uh, meat and drink to his supporters and fans. But I also think, um, particularly since the uh, kind of legal uh, persecution of Donald Trump um, has, has become so ridiculous, so manifold, so complicated, that I think a lot of independent and moderate voters actually would see some sort of retributive justice in Trump's victory. And I think that's why a lot of people are, if polls are correct, a lot of people are saying that they will support Donald Trump at the next, at the election. Michael, what does a second term of Donald Trump in the White House look like? Well, you know, Donald Trump is, among other things, a creature of habit. So I would say a second term probably looks like the first term. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I read... I read uh, Freddie's piece, which I think is 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 terrific. That oh, but I would I would offer a, just a few more footnotes. That um, it's very hard to say um, that there is any north star for Donald Trump, um, whether that's retribution or whether it's anything, um, because he doesn't. Um, I, you know, he 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 fund he fundamentally has. Has doesn't have outward interests. His interests are are totally give me more attention, and not much more than that. Um, and it's always you know whatever Donald Trump does, and it's an that's an, another important thing. What what he does because he doesn't really do much of anything. In other words, he doesn't. Um, he he's not a person who sets out to accomplish things except to speak before before crowds partly because he doesn't really know how to accomplish anything um, um he he's not a um he he's not someone carrying out policy even his own policies um so 
really he's dependent on the on on people around him who has his ear what they want um and then part of the other issue here is you never know who has his ear and nobody has his ear for very long uh, freddie michael there talks about you know trump having a sort of court-like uh, style of governance about who has his ear and that being the way in which decisions are made in the white house what's striking i think perhaps is how, how many of the team um sort of were cast aside one way or another throughout Donald Trump's presidency in the years since. Who currently has his ear right now as he's preparing for a second tilt at the White House? Well, there's lots of speculation uh, about that. Uh, the New York Times has written quite a few reports about uh, Project 25, which is being run by someone called Paul Duns, who uh, worked in the Trump White House before, um, and that they are preparing to recruit enough people to sort of accomplish quite a substantial federal overhaul overhaul of the administrative state, if you like. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I feel uh, reluctant uh, or even very nervous to try and push back on Michael's analysis because nobody knows more about Donald Trump than he does. But I do think uh, with billionaires, with very famous people, they are often uh, capricious, mad, chaotic. Nobody can quite believe um, that they've got to where they are. I think that's extremely the case with Donald Trump. But you do have to look at his uh, political abilities. And I think he's very good at serving up repeatedly over and over again messages that voters want to hear. He knows voters are concerned about immigration. He talks about that. He knows voters are concerned about the cost of living. He talks about that. He knows voters are concerned about energy and the electrical grid. He talks about that. Um, he's, he's pretty good at making uh, his politics work. And I think although people always want to assume that he's being puppeted by people, it is him at the same time. Michael, I want to ask about that because you know, Donald Trump did tap into something in 2016 when he won last time. Um, how much of it is an extent that when he does express these feelings about vengeance, about anger, is he giving voice to a sort of sense of disaffected voter? And uh, how is he going to sort of try and take that and exploit that going forward into the campaign? Well, I would separate two things. I mean, he certainly does tap into, um, a, 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 you know, a remarkable current, um, and um, and has and has embodied it like um, like no one before him. Um, the nature of that is, I mean, there's a lot of um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people like us are trying to figure out the nature of that. Um, and I'm not sure it is exactly clear. He, he certainly understands what he's tapping into. I'm not exactly sure that 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 we do. Um, in, certainly, an example is is the rallies that he holds. You know, and the New York Times writes about them as 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 you know, full of grievances, as angry, as you know, his his anger meeting the anger of of the ten thousand or twenty thousand or sometimes thirty thousand people who. Um, who turn out well? Yes, but I, I've I've been there, and actually, the thing that is that seems most um, impressive and um, and shocking, I suppose, about the rallies is is what a good time everybody is having. So, in in the midst of all these grievances, it's like a country fair, um, you know, and it's a kind of I mean, I, I, I've been looking for how to make this distinction. And one of the things that, that occurs to me is that he doesn't have a political base, he has a fan base. Um, and, um, and, and they turn out because it's fun, because they enjoy what, whatever that experience is. E even if it's a negative experience, him saying, your lives are terrible, they'll never get better with the Democrats. Um, that turns out to be kind of uh, fun, I suppose. You know, the truth is, in the first first administration, everything got done because uh, because essentially Mitch McConnell let it get done. Uh, legislation was written not in the White House; it was written in um, in Congress. And ultimately, if you looked at that first term agenda, you know, it's. It's a pretty straightforward Republican, conservative Republican agenda. Um, 
in, in hindsight, one would not have found it extreme. One would not particularly find it exceptional. It is what the Repub a Republican Congress would have passed under almost any other Republican president. So where this goes in the, in the second administration, again, unclear. Freddie, just as a final question now, we've just had Super Tuesday. Trump won 14 out of 15 states. He's got the Republican nomination locked up. What do you rate his chances are like in the general? Well, if you look at the polling uh, as things stand, uh, he's got an extremely good chance. Uh, you would make him, the bookmakers make him the favorite now. Uh, I mean, the latest polls show him ahead in Pennsylvania. Biden slightly ahead in Wisconsin, which will be an important swing state. But Trump is ahead in Michigan, in Georgia, uh, in Arizona, in Nevada. Um, if he wins most of those, or uh, even three of them, I think he could he can do it. So I think that at the moment, I mean, we've tended always to underestimate Trump in uh, elections uh, in the past. I think perhaps at the moment, because of the polling, we are overestimating his chances because there is still huge opposition uh, to Trump. And you see that in uh, Nikki Haley's campaign. Uh, you know, you see Republicans who a number of Republicans, one in seven, according to one report yesterday, one in seven Republicans will never vote for Donald Trump, which is a big problem for him. So I think it's going to be like it was last time, extremely close. Uh, and it'll be a coin toss, really, possibly. Depend and, in, and I think, as Michael has said to me before, it'll be something in the, in the two weeks before, when things are so close, it'll be something that happens in the two weeks before the election that could swing it one way or the other. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Freddie. Next, Jeremy Hunt delivered his second budget yesterday. He announced a 2p national insurance cut and that the government will be scrapping the non-DOM tax status. Katie Ball spoke to Kate Andrews and David Miles from the Office for Budget Responsibility about all the details. Kate, let's kick off, I think, with the main measures. Uh, there was lots of talk in advance about national insurance or income tax or perhaps both. What did we get? We got another 2p off employee national insurance. If you combine that with the measures in the autumn statement, this brings it from 12% down to 8%. Um, he's offered up today another £10 billion tax cut, but this was not exactly news as it was widely expected as of yesterday, really the past few days, that national insurance is what the, ch is what the Chancellor would go for, not least because it was the cheaper option to income tax. A penny off income tax would have required a £7 billion cut, whereas a penny off national insurance required a uh, five billion pound cut. Um, we also had, if there was anything that looked like a rabbit, I suppose it was the changes to child benefits. Um, he is, I try, think, trying to make that system a bit more fair, changing it from a focus on individual income to household income and changing thresholds and changing the taper uh, to make that system a bit fairer. Um, you had lots of other things that were already briefed. Uh, he has decided to abolish non-domicile tax status, albeit I think that was a softer, more nuanced announcement than many were expecting and we're going to wait to see the details on that. They're announcing a new kind of regime. Uh, and we also have a change to the energy profits levy, the tax on oil and gas companies. That's been extended to 2029. That's not everything the Labour Party was calling for. Uh, the Labour Party wanted the effective tax rate to be higher than the 75% it's at now. But you already had a lot of industry asking, is this really a temporary tax measure? And I think those questions will probably get louder now. But what I was really looking for today was what was happening to the tax burden uh, because of course the Tory party wants to say we're cutting your taxes and the moment Jeremy Hunt sat down, you got a tweet uh, out from the Conservatives saying, we've cut your taxes, dot, 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 again. Um, and Jeremy Hunt was talking about how the effective personal tax rate is now back to its levels, cut to levels that we haven't seen since 1975. But the number I'm looking at is 1948, and that is where the tax burden is heading to, the highest on record since that post-war aftermath. Um, the Tory party may try to say, look, the situation has improved. If we go back to the autumn statement, tax receipts as a percentage of GDP were headed to 37.7%. Um, that was really going to be the record high. That's fallen to 37.1%. But if you look at the graph, which maybe we can pull up on Spectator TV here, it's very clear the tax burden is not falling. It is rising substantially. That makes it a lot harder to craft this narrative that taxes are being cut. Certain taxes are being cut, but the tax burden overall is rising. 
David, there are quite a few Tory MPs who in recent months have dreamt of a tax-cutting bonanza fueled by Jeremy Hunt likening himself to Nigel Lawson, even if more recently, as of Sunday, he likened himself to a prudent Gordon Brown. Do you think they got much in the way of tax-cutting bonanza? Well, I think the situation that faces the government is, is a difficult one. They're running a fiscal deficit. The stock of debt has been going up and up and up for several years now. It's not far off 100% of GDP. They're trying to turn that round because you have to turn that round. You can't have the stock of debt relative to GDP just rising and rising and rising. So the question is, what what's the least bad way of getting to a situation where the stock of debt is not continuing to rise relative to the incomes of the people of this country? And there's no easy way to do that. What they've done today is announce a set of plans which, as Katie rightly said, mean that the overall tax burden as a percentage of GDP goes up. It doesn't go up a whole lot, but it goes up a bit further from a level that's already higher than it was a few years ago. So that goes up by between now and five years down the road. That continues to rise by another 1% of GDP. So it goes from 36% or so to 37% or so, highest in 70 years. So that, that gets you 1% closing the deficit. The other 2% of GDP to close the deficit so that debt doesn't just keep on going up is that government spending relative to GDP will fall by 2% of GDP. So that's the way they've chosen to do something that's really difficult to do and doesn't create any winners, frankly, except if you don't do it, if the counterfactual is you don't care about that, you're on a path that is self-evidently unsustainable. And Kate, I want to talk about some of the measures in further detail, including some of the OBR projections. But first of all, was there anything notably missing to you when it came to that budget? Um, we mentioned that there's no income tax. That's been pretty well covered. But for example, there was a big push for defence spending. Was there anything that struck out to you as, as not there that might have been expected to? I think defence spending is definitely one of them. I think a more generous cut to income or national insurance was expected in a pre-election budget, which raises the question, is this the pre-election budget? Yes, to David's point, you had tax cuts and they're potentially all that Jeremy Hunt could offer up. Um, it's very notable that he is cutting it very fine when it comes to his fiscal headroom. That's down even more. It was about £13 billion to meet his fiscal target in the autumn statement. He's cut that down to about £9 billion. He is cutting it closer than any chancellor dating back to 2010. And he's doing that. He's taking the risk because he wants these tax cuts. So I, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think people certainly within the Tory party, were expecting to see a bit more. Kate mentioned there, David, um, this fact that Jeremy Hunt was under pressure to go wider with those tax cuts. I spoke to MPs, as you know, close to the budget as you know, 11 a.m. Wednesday morning. He was saying, no, 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 we think the bunny, the budget bunny is an income tax cut. I was like, mm, I don't think it is. Um, but there really was a sense perhaps of being so smart by briefing everything out, bar this one thing, when actually... As you said earlier, Kate, probably the closest thing to the bunny was the benefit, the family benefit uh, announcement. But some of these MPs will say, Jeremy Hunt should not have allowed himself to get boxed in by the OBR. And uh, you look at uh, the way that the OBR counts things, if you look at uh, the orthodoxy, as Liz Truss used to say, um, this has meant that they didn't have many options. Um, what would you say to them? Well, part of the criticism of the OBR, which I think is a bit misplaced, is that we don't allow for any positive side effects of tax cuts. Maybe they give people some more money, but we don't allow that to have any positive impact on the supply potential of the economy. And that's not true. Um, today's announcement about the NICS cut, the national insurance cut, we've estimated increases the size of the labour force in the UK, the number of people working by 100,000. We thought that the national insurance cut back in November also did 100,000. That's 200,000 more people working because of the tax cut. That increases the potential output in the UK, generates tax tax revenue to offset slightly the, the lost revenue from, from, from cutting the, the rate itself. So, I mean, I understand the frustration with the OBR because it sometimes can look like, oh, the Chancellor wants to do all these things and grumpy old OBR just says, no, you can't do that, it's too expensive, you can't do that, you can't do that. But the reality is that there's a reason why the government's got a fiscal target, and I think it's a very powerful reason, which is 
that you really can't let the stock of debt just carry on going up and going up faster than the income of this country because it's the income of this country that's the only way that pays for the debt and pays the interest on the debt. And if you're in a situation where you've got to make fiscal policy close the gap between spending and tax revenue, there aren't going to be any easy and nice options. Also, one of the difficulties here is what Liz Truss and her 49-day premiership did to the relationship between the state and the OBR, I think has, has made things a lot worse. It shouldn't be the case that you are boxed in by the OBR. It's a forecast. It's a powerful forecast, but there are lots of independent forecasters too. And it should be possible, especially if we're getting into the nitty gritty of the the calculations and public policy for the government to come out and say the OBR has forecast X for my tax cut or my change to benefits or whatever it may be. They've estimated X. We think Y. And we're going to see what plays out. We're going to see how it works. But because um, because of the chaos that was created back in autumn 2022, I think that's actually made the OBR a bit more powerful. And I think ministers, Jeremy Hunt included, Rishi Sunak included, are probably increasingly nervous about clashing with the OBR in a way that I think would be quite healthy. Again, not across the board on every single issue and you have radically different forecasts, but it'd be very reasonable to say the OBR forecast X were more optimistic. Let's see which one is right. Kate, let's talk about election timing, uh, because certainly this week, every time we've turned on any form of news program, there is a Labour politician saying, it's going to be May. And you had Jonathan Ashworth, for example, uh, placing quite a, a low cost bet compared to Rishi Sunak and his 1,000 bet with Piers Morgan um, on uh, a flight to Rwanda, but placing a bet with Kate Birdie saying, you know, £10 an election May. Now, of course, the Labour tactic is to try and create all this momentum behind the idea the Tories will go to the polls relatively soon, try to put pressure on, and also mean if they don't, they can say, what a load of chickens. But it seemed to me, and I think speaking to MPs after it, that this budget is not fueling the May talk. Instead, it's suggesting quite the opposite. Would you agree? I would agree. And I agree with your analysis on this, Katie. And I'd, I'd love to hear more from you because there are two things that stand out to me. Number one, so long as the Labour Party can say that the UK is in technical recession, I don't know why the Tory government would want to go to the yeah, polls. As they like to call it. They love to call it Rishi's recession. So why would you opt into that? And it's going to take time. We're just simply not going to get the data showing that the UK has almost certainly already left recession in time for a May election. Um, and the other reason is I think that there are plenty of reasons to say, you know, the economy is going to get worse. Things are going to look down. But there are equal number of reasons to say things could start to look better. The main one that jumps out to me is that the Bank of England is likely to slowly but surely start cutting interest rates this spring or summer. Because we had an inflation announcement in that budget. And we did have an inflation announcement in that budget that all of the forecasts were wrong. They were too pessimistic. It looks like inflation is returning to target or something close to it. By spring, by April, we should see some meaningful change in that data. Um, when the April data comes in, again, these things take a bit more time. Um, and that should create a better situation for Jeremy Hunt. He might have more headroom to play with. And why would you cut yourself off to the option of perhaps delivering that income tax cut that his Tory MPs are desperate to see? Um, but I know you've been writing on this too, Katie. Well, one of the things I've been writing about is the fact that, you know, there was a political cabinet, I think, a few months ago, where you had the party's election strategist saying, there are some economic indicators that are going to move in our favour, but it's going to take time. And that was the argument for autumn. So I wonder, David, can you see those two? Um, well, yes. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much in the forecast that we at the OBR put out today. So inflation coming down, you know, quite quickly now on our central forecast anyway. Who knows? You could get, you could get blown off course, of course, by this. Who knows what's going to happen to oil and energy prices and what happens in the Middle East? So there's always risks around it. But our central forecast, as Katie was saying, is that inflation comes down, you know, quite quickly now and maybe at the Bank of England's target level within a few months. Um, that didn't seem likely back in November. It seems much more plausible today. And partly on the back of lower interest rates, I mean, we've already seen interest rates come down a bit relative to the back end of last year. And energy prices are a bit lower at the moment, surprisingly in a way, given what's happening in the Middle East. Um, those are enough, we think, to 
uh, generate growth in the economy now. Maybe we're already out of recession. We won't know, as Katie said, for a few months because of the lags before you get the GDP estimates. Um, so on the central forecast, things do get better during the course of this year. In this week's magazine, Douglas Murray says that the war in the Middle East has only just begun. A showdown with Tehran is looming, he says. To discuss, Douglas joins me now. Now, Douglas, uh, you write your column this week about two underreported stories about the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict. Uh, tell us about them. Well, yes, it, uh, it's uh, extraordinary to me that at the same time the world is understandably talking about the refugees in Gaza, there is almost no international attention on the tens of thousands of Israeli families who are refugees within Israel. Uh, the Israeli government doesn't like to call them refugees. They are known as internally displaced people. But these are the thousands, tens of thousands of people from the north of Israel who were moved south uh, on October the 7th and who cannot return to their homes because they're all uh, being regularly uh, assaulted by rockets from Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon. Um, and of course, also people from the south of Israel who were moved out on the 7th by the Israeli government because they're also under rocket fire from Gaza. Um, uh, these people get absolutely no attention on them. And I mentioned a bit about this in the piece. It's very striking to me um, why that is. Uh, the second thing that I mentioned in the piece that is almost completely uh, unreported upon in the press outside of Israel is the fact that, as I say in my column this week, uh, in my view, the war may well have not yet begun. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, Hamas is the, in British car terms, the Ford Cortina of Iran. Uh, it's being smashed. And uh, in my view, I hope that it's, it's, it's smashed completely. I, I think there's no point, uh, as Minister Benny Gantz said this week, of putting out three quarters of a fire. You either put out the whole of a fire or, or you don't bother. Uh, and the way in which David Cameron and others this week have been calling on Israel to effectively stop uh, stop fighting the fire is, I think, profoundly unhelpful. But but uh, if, if uh, Hamas is the Fort Cortina proxy of Iran, Hezbollah is its Lamborghini. And by that, I mean that, you know, this is about 160,000 much higher grade missiles that Hezbollah has stored in the south of Lebanon in an area that, of course, after the 2006 war, the UN passed a resolution that was meant to be demilitarized and stripped of such rockets. But, of course, the international community didn't abide by that resolution, 1701. Uh, and so, in my view, uh, uh, as long as the because these two things connect, as long as the citizens of Israel cannot live in their homes in the north of the country, um, this war cannot be over. And then the real war is the much bigger war uh, against Hezbollah, the other proxy of Iran in southern Lebanon. And I'm not sure that outside of the region, it's widely understood that this is the situation. When I hear comments from uh, Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron and others, you might get the impression that the Gaza war is all there is to this. And that is such a massive miscalculation, a demonstration of ignorance of the actual situation. You also write, in terms of different angles which haven't really been covered on this conflict, about the tens of thousands of Israelis who've been displaced and lost uh, their homes. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I say there that, I mean, these are, these are people for whom there seems to be no particular international notice or international sympathy. Um, uh, I've lived among them uh, for some months, and uh, it's, it's a terrible thing. I mean... Uh, many of them have been put up in hotels by the Israeli government. And some people might say, well, that sounds OK. Actually, you know, it might be fun to live with your whole family in a hotel room for a week. It's not much fun for months on end, let alone if uh, it's clear that you can't return to your home for the foreseeable future. These are all children missing out on their educations or at least missing out on much of their education. Uh, people unable to do their work, farmers unable uh, to tend to their crops or fields. Um, I'm just sort of startled by the fact that this gets so little attention. And one of the only things I think justifies or explains why it is, is because, of course, these people are being looked after by the Israeli government. They're Israeli citizens, Israeli civilians of a bewildering array of backgrounds and uh, and religions. But they are they are Israeli civilians being looked after by the Israeli government. 
I suppose that as the world watches what's happening in Gaza, um, perhaps it thinks, uh, you know, that, that Israel also has to have um, all total control and responsibility for all Gazan civilians. But actually, of course, the civilians of Gaza were meant to be under the protection of Hamas and the governance of Hamas. But then we can see how well that worked out. Um, but yes, I mean, in a way, the Israeli displaced are being ignored because their government is actually looking after them. Mm. Ironic. And what would an escalation in northern Israel look like? You talk about, uh, you know, the border there. Hezbollah has around 160,000 rockets on the border there. What would any escalation in that region look like? Well, I've been up there a lot recently, as I have over the years. I was there during the 2006 conflict uh, 18 years ago. Uh, as Hezbollah was shelling the north of Israel and rocketing it. Um, and I've been up there quite a lot in recent months uh, in places like Mount Moron and uh, Matula and Kiret Shimona and elsewhere. And I can tell you that uh, both sides, both Hezbollah and Israel, have an interest in downplaying the amount of activity on that border. Uh, but I can tell you from my own eyewitness that uh, there's a lot more activity than anyone is admitting. Um, artillery, um, air assaults, uh, rockets being fired regularly uh, by Hezbollah, uh, RPGs, uh, anti-tank, much more. Uh, um, the, the whole area is an absolute tinderbox. And uh, as I was up on Mount Moron the other week, actually, four Hamas uh, fighters, in a, 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 I mean, consider that, that doesn't get much attention, four Hamas from Lebanon. Um, crossed the border into Israel on a uh, mission to kill um, Israelis, and they were killed themselves, and they injured quite a lot of IDF. Um, but th these things get almost no international notice. Um, but you know, if you go to a place like Matula, a small town which is surrounded on all three on three sides um, by Hezbollah, you know, you can see the Hezbollah bases; they're absolutely everywhere. The Hezbollah listening posts. Uh, the Hezbollah rocket uh, um, uh, bases. Uh, these are all there. And, and I reiterate, it's so, it's so strange because, you know, 18 years after I was last seeing that there, uh, and 18 years after that conflict was meant to have ended with this not happening and with the international community ensuring that Hezbollah could not have this knife at Israel's throat, there it is, um, bigger and better and glossier than ever, Hezbollah's armory in Lebanon. And uh, this, is, this is, of course, a tragedy uh, uh, for Lebanon, among other things. Uh, Hezbollah has, ha has helped to ruin that country. Um, but yes, uh, the, the eradication of this arsenal has to happen at some point. Um, one Israeli told me a little while ago that he thought there was maybe a 30% chance, 30% chance, of there actually being a diplomatic solution to this, i.e. the international community might actually enforce its own resolution and persuade Hezbollah to remove its arsenals uh, from the, the, the area that's meant to be demilitarized. But that, is, as math geniuses will have noticed, is a minority, therefore, likelihood. It's much more likely that uh, Hezbollah and Israel are on a kind of tandem bicycle cycling downhill and Whoever stops pedaling first, we don't know, but it's going to crash. Um, the, uh, the, I think a lot of people outside the region don't realize that there's, there's basically two reasons why Hezbollah has this weaponry in the south of Lebanon. One is just to use it at any point or at some point against Israel. And as I say, it's, it's using it a lot. Just the other night, they fired a barrage of about 50 or 60 missiles. They keep on testing the Iron Dome. There were 30 again the other day. Um, it's pretty extraordinary to see. Uh, but yes, these, these pretty significant barrages go off on a regular basis now, are mainly shot down, but are not always shot down by Israel's Iron Dome. But maybe that is why Hezbollah has this buildup of weaponry. But there's a second reason, of course, which is that it, it, it exists there in order to be used or have the threat of using it at such a time as Israel, America, or any other international force um, in any way struck Iran, the revolutionary Islamic government in Iran, in order to stop it getting to the final point of its long desired nuclear ambitions. Um, if there were a strike against Iran by Israel, by America or others to stop it getting to the final stage of getting a nuclear bomb, which they say the regime in Tehran has 
been very clear that it has wanted for decades now. Uh, if if there was such a strike, arguably that's when uh, Iran would uh, get Hezbollah to start firing. And, and people shouldn't underestimate this threat, both the Iranian nuclear threat, which lots of people have put to the back of their minds in recent years, um, but is still going on, still very much the ambition of the regime in Tehran. Um, so the first thing is that they shouldn't underestimate that. And the second thing is they shouldn't underestimate the nature of the arsenal of weaponry in uh, Hezbollah that Hezbollah owns and has stored in southern Lebanon. Uh, many of these are much more advanced missiles um, than the ones that Hamas has had. Uh, partly, of course, because although there wasn't a successful blockade on stopping rockets getting into Gaza, there was some blockade. Um, and uh, but these the the, the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah have Iranian weaponry of a pretty high caliber. Uh, that could reach much, if not most, of Israel. And uh, that's just an intolerable situation for any country uh, to live under. And as I say, these two issues, if you bring them together, the displaced people in the north of Israel and the munitions that Hezbollah has stockpiled pointing in their direction, uh, you see that, as I say in the column this week, arguably the war in the Middle East has not yet begun. Everything we've had so far is a prelude. Douglas Murray, thank you very much. Owen Matthews writes for this week's magazine that Vladimir Putin has become a hollow czar in his nearly 25 years in charge of Russia. He ruined the country's prospects, Owen says. Owen joins the show now. Now, Owen, you write in this week's Spectator magazine about uh, the upcoming Russian presidential election. Uh, two years ago last month, it was that Russia invaded Ukraine. And Vladimir Putin is now heading for what looks like a, a fifth term as uh, president. Can you tell us about the future of Russia? In your piece, you talk about Putin being a hollow czar. What do you mean by this? Um, the thrust of my piece, uh, as well as just focusing everyone's minds on the fact that Putin isn't going anywhere, uh, much as many of us would wish it, <laughs> wish him to disappear, and what a lot of people hoped, I think, when they realised how he'd overreached and um, in in Ukraine. Um, so the first point was to you know emphasize that putin is uh putin's regime is uh remarkably stable um but uh the realities that underpin that apparent stability i think are more fragile than um putin himself claims and uh i realize there's a bit of a danger and i myself uh, re realize that over my career i've you know very often predicted that Russia has feet of clay and will fall apart, and it hasn't happened yet. But um, I think um, the two things that really underpin his confidence, I think even the cockiness um, of uh, Vladimir Putin's cockiness, is uh, that the economy has not been crippled or um, crashed by sanctions, and that the majority of people still support him. Uh, both those things are broadly true, but actually fundamentally, uh, if you dig down a little bit into the numbers, you see that actually uh, the war is hemorrhaging 40% of the government's income, uh, they're, not to mention the cost in uh, in you know, blood on the Russian side and obviously on the Ukrainian side. But um, they are drawing down their uh, stabilization fund, um, and that's at current rates of four billion a month, they're going to run out fairly soon. Um, and the um, money by w which Putin has promised to his people um, has to come from somewhere. And it's not really clear that the export of oil, which is what's currently buoying up the Russian economy, is going to be enough. So, uh, and that's why I think he's a hollow czar because this sort of uh, this this last period of late putinism the organizing principle remains war um and um ideologically um he's going to have to maintain until the end of his days that he's defending his country against uh, some sort of global assault by the collective west and that's really the the only really the the only un ideological underpinning that remains to him. And I don't think that's a particularly strong or stable basis on which to build an ongoing regime. Yes, I want to ask about that. How much resonance does that idea of sort of Russian nationalism, about Russia being under threat, 
about Putin standing up as a strong man to protect his nation's interests. How much resonance does that really have, particularly with those generations of Russian um, who don't really remember the Soviet Union? It was sort of born after 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. How much can that, how longer, much longer can that idea endure of uh, Putin posing as a kind of traditional Russian nationalist, um, as you write about in the sort of mold of the 20th century uh, Russian autocrats? Uh, that's unfortunately an un unanswerable question, James. Uh, how long can it can um, how long can it can it continue? Uh, all we can say is that actually it's uh, that message that Putin is sort of defending Russia against the collective West has proved to be remarkably resilient and is held by all kinds of Russians. Exactly how many we can't know. The pollsters. Um, ask people and they very often uh, parrot the party line and then we discover that a convulsion happens like in 1991 but um, or indeed in 1917. Um, the difference between those two revolutionary situations and today is uh, is really clear is that actually for a revolution to happen in Russia historically you need three things to be the case. One of them is you need to have a, a regime that's been profoundly discredited, usually by catastrophic defeat in in war, um, a economic crisis that has shown that the government is unable to deliver sort of basic living standards, and also crucially, a, you know, a clear alternative to the old regime. Um, none of those things are even remotely true at the moment in Russia today. And you talk in your piece about um, Erdogan of Turkey, and you say that uh, sometimes I think critics of Putin sort of misunderstand him. You call him a, a brilliant a populist. What are the ways in which um, Putin tries to um, exploit populism when he's governing? Well, first and foremost, as we've already discussed, he um, claims to be defending Russia from these uh, jeopardies and, the, uh, and the, the, the aggression of the West, which uh, he claims and claimed in his State of the Nation speech most recently uh, at the end of, uh, end of February, that the West is out to humiliate and destroy Russia, and he's pushing back against that. But actually, one of the striking things about that State of the Nation speech was he only spent 15 minutes talking about the, the the war and spent the rest of the time talking about his domestic program and making exactly the kind of promises that regular politicians, uh, particularly regular pol populist politicians like Erdogan, uh, make, which is basically to sort of flood the base, uh, the electoral base, with money. And Putin's electoral base is the so-called budgetniki. It's the people who, the tens of millions of Russians who rely on the state budget, either directly or indirectly, for their income. And to those people, um, Putin sort of promised uh, promised the earth, uh, you know, subsidies and healthcare and education and infrastructure, like all this sort of nuts and bolts of administration. That was really his main thrust. It was not you know, join me in my sort of patriotic death cult, and I will sort of, you know, save you all. Uh, it's really just, you know, I will just continue to make sure that you are safe from Western aggression, and that you will be able to put sort of, uh, you know, fill your fridges and uh, enjoy a reasonable standard of living. And that's, um, you know, the, 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 the populist part is that actually it's not just based on ideology. It's based on actually sort of delivering, you know, you know a basic improvement in living standards. And that's always been sort of the magic of the Putin regime. And it's a magic that he hopes to be able to uh, sustain, but it's not entirely clear how he's going to be able to afford it. Yes, because you say in the piece that the Russian Ministry of Finance expects military expenditure to fall next year. Uh, what do you think sort of the narrative will be which Putin tries to sell the Russian people? You mentioned there a lot about you know, the economy, domestic agenda, etc. How will he approach another term in office? Uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the biggest question is how he's going to end the war. And um, I think... Um, Right now, um, with so many months of, of basic stalemate, and even uh, at the moment, the vector of the war is actually going in Russia's favor. They have, uh, uh, last month, they captured the town of Avdiivka. They're advancing beyond that very bloodily and slowly. Um, I personally don't think that Putin cares at all whether this town or that town in Donbass or Crimea or, or, or in Donbass um, is Ukrainian or Russian. I don't think it really matters. Um, where that line of control actually is, is not a gigantically important thing. Um, I think in Putin's mind, he already thinks that he's won. 
uh, and that was why September 2022, the four regions of Ukraine were formally brought into the Russian Federation. They, they changed the constitution. As far as he is concerned, you know, the box is ticked. And if you look at the Russian press coverage of the war, um, you'll see, you know, on television, you know, the war is, you know, item number three, item number five, it's, you know, buried, you know, it's not, not on the front pages of, this, of the state controlled newspapers. The war is not a big deal uh, for Putin's, you know, uh, propaganda package. It's all about future prosperity. So in, um, and that's why, consequently, I think he's, uh, uh, his people are talking about you know, a ceasefire. Is that like we're we're ready to ready to, to 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 talk about a ceasefire and then go ahead and name some ridiculously unreasonable terms? But I think you know, basically what Putin wants is just for the war to stop, claim victory, and just move on and claim that peace dividend. Um, at the same time, um, I don't think there's any reasonable that there's any expectation that the Ukrainians will sign off on this. So you know, we're looking at a sort of frozen conflict, I think, in the, in the best possible scenario. But for Putin, I think that's fine. He just wants to freeze the conflict He and he uh, and, and, and move on. And hence, even the finance ministry is forecasting that essentially, you know, they're going to enjoy a peace div dividend in 2025. Owen Matthews, thank you very much. And finally, it's been a big week of royal news. A royal relation has entered the Big Brother house and Harry's pants have gone up for sale. To discuss it all, hi Anlo, I'm joined by the journalist and author Angela Levin. Angela, it's been a big week of royal news. Um, a photo of the Princess of Wales was published in the American media this week, but it's not being published uh, in the UK press. So tell us why. Well, it's very interesting that it's a bit like if someone is taken hostage and there's a, a conversation between all the leading newspapers mm -hmm. and they say, please don't mention this at the moment until we give you the go ahead. And I think that's what they've done with um, Princess. And I think that the, one of the reasons is because they don't want to be nagged all the time. You know, where is she, what's she doing, and all the guesswork. And any paper that would do that wouldn't be, um, the, the, the palace would be so unhappy about it that they wouldn't want to give them the good stuff of when she's out and let them know. I mean, it can be quite strong. The result of that is really everybody's making up and an A to Z of what it could be from changing her face um, to, you know, something very serious indeed. It obviously is serious up to a certain extent because she wouldn't have had to be in hospital for two weeks. But I, I think now that they, they could give a little bit um, because people are getting, you know, almost hysterical about what it is and focused on that and nothing else in the family. I think she deserves privacy, uh, but I think that there's so many hungry people that need just a little bit of information so that they stop making up a load of unkind nonsense. Yes, I mean, the palace's traditional policy has been never complain, never explain, but in the social media age, that's probably coming under more and more scrutiny and it's going to be a bit of a challenge to keep that going isn't it? It is actually I mean it, things are very very different now because they get found out or someone just has an idea doesn't put their name on and says this is what's happening and then it gets you know thousands of people following them in in an hour so it's not a good way of doing it I think you have to rethink all these things because um, it, it's a sort of 24-hour um, storytelling, isn't it? It is, and unfortunately, obviously, these health crises for various members of the royal family or health issues has coincided at the same time. Um, tell us, do you think that's going to be affecting kind of the royal family as an institution right now? I think um, we're all very worried about the health. I almost didn't sleep the first night I heard about oh, yeah. King Charles getting cancer because I thought, you know, He's done brilliantly well. He's made the sm a smooth change after his mother died and he's working hard and he's opening up. He's much more accessible than he used to be. This is partly his dear wife, Camilla. But um, I thought, no, he's just got hold of it now. And I think it was really a, a huge shame. And then you realize that the heir to the throne is very firmly saying he's going to look after his wife and cut right back on um, doing work for the for the country, and um, 
King Charles told him that was quite the right thing to do. And you just think, who's coming? And I thought, if Harry stands any chance, you know, it would be hell. Mm. Because Meghan would take over, he won't say anything. He'll bow to her and that would be the end of all of us. Do you think the recent health difficulties for some certain members of the senior royal family has exposed perhaps how you know, five years ago you know, the firm had the late Queen, Prince Philip, as Harry and Meghan, it seemed there sort of uh, sort of many more shoulders on which the burden could fall. But in recent weeks, perhaps we've seen, uh, you know, obviously the King's health issues, he's in the Princess of Wales, etc. Do you think there is a, perhaps a danger that the burden is falling on too few people, perhaps? I don't actually, because I think it's much better to have keen, devoted people to the country and to the monarchy than having sort of lazy people who resent it, mm. who expect to be paid on every engagement. I couldn't believe that when Meghan complained about that a um, long time ago. And um, I think that, um, y you know, you feel that it won't last forever. It's a bad patch which we all get in our families. And I think that it's much better. You've got Princess Anne. The Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh are very helpful. They get on with them. Things. They don't make a big fuss, but they really get on with their work. And I, and I think they can spread it out. I thought it was a very good idea for a suggestion that Queen Camilla and, when she's well enough, Princess Catherine, can take over giving the honours to people. So making them knighthood and giving them all the various badges and the level. And I think everyone would be delighted to see Camilla nowadays and throw to bits mm -hmm if uh, Catherine did that. And it's stable, it's in a palace, and it's done very carefully. And uh, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be too much work for them. I thought that was a very good idea because you could take the heaviness of that off King Charles and off uh, Prince William. On a slightly nicer note, uh, this morning the Sun newspaper has splashed a, a photograph of what is purportedly Prince Harry's uh, former underwear, or one-time underwear, um, from that Las Vegas experience. And uh, I think uh, the woman who's selling them is getting a sort of nice six-figure sum for them. Um, we were just talking before we get on air about uh, another member of the royal families or, or related royal families' plans later this month. Tell us more. Yes, well, with um, Prince Harry, one of the women who was up there when he was playing um, he, he was abroad mm. and uh, he had no clothes on. Um, and she's been furious that he didn't include her in his book Spare. So she decided, uh, I don't know, something he was, he was proud of. But um, anyway, she, she was very cross about that. And she's got lots of photographs of him. And she sold his knickers, um, which is acutely embarrassing. You wonder why he didn't take them with him, don't you, really? <laughs> um, and then um, Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, he has a memoir coming out at the end of March, mm. and that is all um, in it. He says, explains how he lost his virginity at the age of 12 <laughs> because he gave an Italian prostitute um, 15 pounds. And you think, why is the royal family washing their own dirty linen in public? I mean, it was... Hello. It's astonishing, isn't it? Or having it sold off. <laughs> or having it sold off or making money out of knickers. Well, they'd, Harry, I don't suppose, is clean. His knickers are being sold. But um, it, is, it is distasteful, isn't it? Well, talking of, I mean, also news celebrity Big Brother, there's reports that you know, Gary Goldsmith is going into the house there um, amid claims perhaps that some of um, the Princess royal family didn't want that to happen. Uh, tell us more about that. I think it's absolutely appalling that he's done that. He goes in and says, I don't want to be a celebrity. And he's been in, he's in the celebrity programme, isn't he? Mm. Um, he said he wouldn't say anything that would upset them. But I think he, they will be very upset because all he's known for is to be um, the, the, bro the uncle of Catherine. Um, he doesn't really stand in his own right as a celebrity. And he said all sorts of things that I find really unpleasant. That he said that um, Will, who he, it's William, well, right. which is not very polite, uh, Will, all that I've seen him all the time, um, he, holding out a olive branch to get his brother to come back. Now, I'm under the impression 
that William doesn't want to speak to his brother, doesn't want to see him, doesn't make time to see him. So I think, is this uncle right? Because that changes the whole thing, isn't it? We think Harry really wants to see his brother, but William doesn't because he was so rude about himself and about his wife. So I thought that was a strange thing to say. But then he said, oh yes, she's absolutely lovely, um, but e inside even more than outside. But he then says, what I really like doing is um, ruffling up people and making them fed up with me. So you, you think, oh dear, this is really a disaster. For the first night, he looked very uncomfortable with everybody, but he seems unfortunately to settle down a bit. But um, he should, it's a bit like a sort of naughty teenager in there, rather than somebody in their late 50s. Do you think that's a bit different than when Mike Tyndall, Zara's husband, went in to uh, do I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here at the Jungle? But I suppose he was a celebrity in his own right, being a World Cup winner in 2003. Yes, I think he started this um, way of behaving, mm. and I don't think it's a very good idea. I mean, he's been terrific. Um, in the royal family. He hasn't made any fuss. But I think you still, you don't go out and spill beans. You don't go out and um, tell all these intimate details. I thought it was very bad and I wondered if someone else would think, well, if he does that, I can. And and it would seem to be right. And um, I don't think it's, it's not dignified. Mm. Angela Levin, thank you very much. That's it for this week. Thanks to our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support during our challenging times. Visit CanDoWealth.com for more information. Once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss another episode. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week. Mm -hmm.